and welcome to the Yorkshire Museum. I'm Emily North, one of the Associate Collections Curators here at York Museums Trust. And today I'm going to be talking a little bit about what some of the objects in our collection can tell us about life in the Roman countryside uh, in Roman Britain. This talk is part of a series of talks and lectures that we're delivering uh, online as part of our programming running alongside the uh, exhibition we have here at the Yorkshire Museum about the Rydell Roman Horde. So if you're in the area, please do come along to the museum if you can and see the exhibition. Uh, we really hope you'll enjoy it. So when we think about Roman Britain, often we think about military settlements, forts, fortresses uh, and big towns and cities like the fortress and city of Eberacum, Roman York. However, it's really important to acknowledge that only one in 10 people in Roman Britain lived in cities and towns. Nine tenths of the population lived in rural environments. And until relatively recently, uh, what we have known about the lifestyles in the Roman countryside in Britain has been limited compared to what we knew about the cities. Um, previously, most of the archaeological attention that's been paid to life in the Roman countryside has focused on villas. That's because they uh, produce such fantastic objects, uh, really, uh, really intricate mosaics, uh, buildings themselves, and also uh, small finds um, that gave insights into the lives of really wealthy people but the vast majority of people lived on farmsteads. And that's only really been started to be understood in recent decades because more evidence has come to light and there's been more of a focus on understanding the lives of average people in the Roman countryside. Uh, in the 1970s, planning law changed and that meant that whenever there was a development in the countryside of new buildings and new houses, for example, uh, and new roads, that meant that there had to be archaeological investigation that took place in advance. And this meant that um, money and funding went towards excavating parts of the landscape that wouldn't normally have been, uh, been excavated. And so smaller settlements and smaller farms uh, from Roman Britain have been discovered and uh, researched archaeologically in more detail. We also have had developments in archaeological science, uh, such as the analysis of grains and animal remains and geophysical surveying techniques that allow us to get a glimpse of what's beneath the uh, surface of the soil without necessarily having to dig. There's also been uh, advances in aerial photography techniques. Uh, and what this can do is it can show patterns in crop marks, because if there's archaeology under the surface of the soil, such as walls, then the uh, plant's roots have less nutrients and less room to grow. And so from, viewed from the sky, you can see these patterns in uh, different growth levels of uh, grass and crops as well. So this can give us hints as to the type of settlement that might be there without having to dig. In addition to this, there's also schemes such as the Portable Antiquities Scheme, that have been diligently recording finds made by members of the public, uh, be that through field walking, metal detecting, uh, or in their own uh, gardens. This has created a massive database of objects that have been found uh, in rural environments where people are going out metal detecting and walking. Uh, and this database allows us to do large scale statistical analysis of types of objects that are being found and what insights those might give us into how the landscape was used in Roman Britain. So as I said, the vast majority of, uh, of settlements, of rural settlements in Roman Britain, were these small farmsteads. Many of these uh, originated in the Iron Age period and continued to be use, used, uh, changing slightly into the Roman period uh, and throughout the centuries that followed. But there was also a big surge in creation of new farmsteads in the second century AD. And one of the objects we have here on display can give us a little bit of a, uh, an insight into some of the circumstances that might have explained this surge in new occupation. That's this object here, which is a Roman military diploma. 
This is uh, one of two of these that we have in the collection and they're really, really exciting, rare objects. Uh, not many have been found from Roman Britain and so it's fantastic when they are discovered. Uh, the reason these are so exciting is that they are official certificates uh, that were issued to Roman military uh, soldiers and cavalrymen upon the completion of their military service after 20 or 25 years of service. So these would be officially uh, issued by the empire uh, with information about the nature of the service, the duration of it, uh, who the individual was and when it was issued, all inscribed into metal plaques uh, and they would be incredibly important personal objects. These were evidence of the completion of service and the new rights and benefits that came with the completion of military service. This includes citizenship for the individual who carried out military service, but also for their family and their future children, uh, which is really important and brought uh, really important rights in the Roman world. Military veterans in Britain were also sometimes awarded a parcel of land upon completion of their military service. And this is probably uh, the reason for some of those new farmsteads that were founded in the second century, because veterans who completed their service were given a small parcel of land and then used that land to set up their own business as a small farmer. This plaque in particular, although it's very fragmentary, um, does give us a little bit of an insight into who received it. Uh, unfortunately, we don't know their name, but we do know that it was issued in the middle of the second century to a cavalryman of the second cohort Gallorum who was stationed in Britain. Uh, and we can only wonder what their life, what they went on to do with their life and whether they did in fact uh, found a small farm. In the 3rd and 4th century, across Britain, many of these farmsteads were abandoned. This is partly due to political turmoil across the empire, uh, perhaps causing people to worry about the stability of their farms and move to other uh, wealthier environments, such as cities and towns. Uh, we know from looking at human remains uh, from cities compared to human remains from uh, rural environments in Roman Britain, that health and well-being were much, much poorer in rural environments. Um, in part, this is because those rural environments were, those farms were responsible for feeding the cities and feeding the uh, military in Roman Britain. Uh, and their produce was, uh, they paid their taxes in the form of their produce, which sometimes left very little for them themselves. Interestingly, though, around York in the 3rd and 4th centuries, there's very uh, little, there's no evidence of any real population change from the 2nd century. Uh, perhaps this is because Ibaracum was the provincial capital of the north of Britain, and in the 3rd century hosted, and the 4th century hosted emperors in the city. So perhaps that extra prestige, that extra wealth and stability meant that people living in the outskirts of York and in the Vale of York had that extra uh, financial support and extra commercial viability that allowed them to stay. Some of these small holding, these farmsteads, did grow and develop into vast estates and it's on these estates that we find villas. Here we have a, uh, a small piece from a roundel that was found at the, a villa, a presumed villa at Alston on the outskirts uh, in the Vale of York. Uh, this figure is a, uh, a female figure. Uh, we don't know who, um, but we know that this ornate mosaic would have been in the entranceway to probably a very, very large villa that was placed uh, at the meeting point of two Roman roads. This would have allowed all of the uh, produce that was produced on the vast farming estates that surrounded these villas to be easily transported and traded uh, to places like Ibaracum. Um, we know that on these vast estates, uh, they were probably worked not by wealthy people, 
uh, the wealthy people who were living in the households, but they instead had tenant farmers, and these tenant farmers would work the land and for uh, the rights to work that land would pay very high sums of taxes and rents to the wealthy people who owned the villas themselves. In Roman Britain, there's limited evidence for uh, the role that enslaved people played in the Roman countryside, but we know that elsewhere in the Roman Empire, enslaved people uh, would also have important roles working in villas in domestic um, settings, but also working on uh, agricultural land surrounding villas, were, uh, producing the produce that they would then trade. The villas themselves were probably occupied and owned by the uh, wealthy elite from the cities who spent part of their time in the cities themselves and then would spend the other part of their time uh, enjoying their lavish countryside villas. And it's from villas like this that a lot of these small finds, uh, such as writing implements, uh, expensive pottery, jewellery, um, that those are found. In the smaller settlements, in the farmsteads, fine, uh, finds like that are much, much rarer. And that means it's much harder for us to uh, tell those stories and understand the lifestyles uh, that were experienced by the vast majority of people. However, we do have a few types of finds that can give us some insights. Uh, so I will, I'll show you some of, the, some of the types of finds that can tell us a bit more. One of the things that survives from uh, farming environments is the tools that were used. This object here, this large pointed object, is part of a ploughshare. Uh, this would have been affixed to a large wooden plough that would then have been pulled by oxen. Uh, and how it works is it would have created a groove in the soil, would have turned over the soil as it went, uh, burying any weeds and bringing fresh nutrients to the top and then uh, seeds could then be sown in the groove that it had created. We also have here a pickaxe with a hammer end. This was found at Bainbridge Roman Fort. So that's another type of tool that would have been used. And at the very back, we have a spade shoe. Um, now, the way these worked was they were affixed to wooden spades uh, used for digging and breaking up um, sort of hard stones and things. But rather than having to uh, replace your entire wooden spade every time it got blunt, you could make it stronger and more durable by fitting an iron spade shoe to the rim. And then you could just replace the shoe as and when needed. And in front of that, we have a small knife that was found at Catterick. And what's especially nice about this knife is that it uh, gives a little bit more of a personal insight because it's stamped with a maker's mark. It says Victor VF, uh, Victor V fake it, Victor V made this knife. So someone really taking pride in their craft uh, for producing really what is quite a practical tool. As well as the tools, we can learn a lot from uh, the environmental evidence that we have uh, of the produce that was being, uh, being farmed. So here we have some animal bone uh, and also some archaeological grains that have incredibly survived in the soil. By looking at uh, all the data that's been built up across the country and across the Roman Empire of, of looking at archaeological remains like this, uh, we know that uh, throughout the Roman period, the farming of cattle uh, overtook the farming of sheep, uh, and these cattle were used for uh, predominantly for meat, but also for uh, pulling ploughs, for example, and, and pulling carts and heavy equipment. The grains tell us that in the Roman period in Britain, far more land was available and was cultivated for growing grains. And we know from documentary evidence that there were some times in, uh, during Roman occupation of Britain where a surplus of grain was being produced and it was able to be exported to help feed the rest of the empire. Um, so a really, really productive industry in Britain. We can also gain some insights into uh, the produce when it was traded. Objects like this 
uh, steel yard balance and steel yard weight can help us to picture what, uh, how Roman markets would have functioned. Uh, so this weight is in the shape of a uh, male bust, probably depicting a, a deity or a hero from mythology. Uh, this is a particularly ornate and beautiful example of a steel yard weight. Some of them are much plainer. They would have been used in conjunction with the object you see behind, which is a steel yard beam. And essentially, these were scales. If you look closely at the beam, you can hopefully see that there are little notches uh, marked in it. These would have marked different weights. And you uh, hung the weight. Uh, so, for example, in this case, our, our bust, you would hang him from whichever quantity was be of uh, grain, for example, was being purchased and then you, you would hang the grain from the hook on the other side, and when they balanced, you would know that a fair amount was being given for the price that was being paid. Uh, interestingly, a lack of evidence can sometimes, sometimes give us insights into how the rural economy worked as well. Uh, so there's surprisingly no real evidence of large-scale grain storage uh, from rural environments which you would expect given the, you would expect these storage facilities to exist given the amounts of grain that was being produced. So what has been suggested as a theory is that actually farmers sold their grain and sold their produce directly to merchants who would travel around the country gaining produce and it's the merchants who would then take the produce to market to be sold in cities and towns like Ibrahim. So it would be the merchants that were probably using steel yard weights and beams like this. So how does this understanding of lifestyle and the context of the Roman countryside in Britain give us an insight into the Rydale Roman Horde? Um, well, the Rydale Roman Horde is a combination of four objects, and it's quite an unusual combination of objects, a very unusual combination. The most ornate object is a scepter head depicting the bust of the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, probably used by a priest for religious purposes. There's also a horse and rider figurine believed to be depicting the god Mars, so another religious uh, Im uh, image and item. Uh, the third object is a horse-shaped key handle. Uh, but the fourth object is very strange by comparison um, and is very, very humble. It's a plum bob. Uh, now we have another plum bob here on display, uh, which is also, it's got a little bit of decoration on it, but is uh, fairly humble. It's that sort of diamond shaped object with the loop um, that you can see in front of the mosaic. The way that plum bobs were used in Roman Britain and are still used today is that they were hung from string and this would give, uh, because they were pulled by gravity, this would give a straight downward line. So if you needed to do a straight downward line, you could use that to mark it out. Often four of them would be used together on a machine called a gromer. Uh, and this would be uh, sort of mark out right angles and straight lines so that you could measure straight angles and straight, uh, straight right angles and straight lines uh, across vast areas of uh, the landscape. And it's, it's how the Romans made their roads so straight and their forts so rectangular. Um, so this object being included in the hoard tells us that there was something, probably something very significant about the landscape uh, and that the landscape played an important role in the decision to bury these uh, objects in the ground together. We know from other rural religious sites uh, and from documentary evidence that religious rituals would be carried out uh, at, place, at boundaries in the landscape, uh, places where ownership of land changed from one person to another, um, but also at times of changing use of the landscape or at the beginning and end of new projects, so a new building project or a, a new farming enterprise. So the presence of the, uh, of the plumb bob in the hoard understood within the context of 
the heavy taxation, uh, the wealth of villa estates, uh, and the sort of uh, challenges that might have been faced by people living in rural Roman Britain uh, can help us to sort of draw some, con draw some conclusions, give us some idea of the kind of thinking of why someone might have been calling on assistance from the gods uh, to, with their working of the land and how they were using the land when they made this deposition. So I hope you've uh, enjoyed today's talk. If you have any questions, do pop them in the comments and uh, I'll do my best to answer them. Um, while you're typing um, or thinking, uh, I will just flag again that this is part of a series of talks. We have one more in the series, that's on the 16th of March. Uh, Dr. John Pierce is going to be joining us and giving us a lecture about the gods in Roman Britain. Um, so that will no doubt be excellent. So please do join us online for that. Uh, and if you're interested in some of our previous talks that we've done in the series, uh, they're all available on our YouTube channel. Uh, just click on the tab that says live and they should all be listed there. And you can see some of the talks we've delivered over the course of this exhibition. And again, if you are in York uh, or Yorkshire and you're or Britain and available, uh, able to come to the Yorkshire Museum to see this wonderful exhibition, please do. Um, and we really hope you enjoy your visit. So if there are any questions. I've got a question asking what the thin, sharp objects are underneath the plumb bob. Yes, so these, I didn't talk about these um, in detail. I'm sorry about that. So uh, these are styli or styluses. Uh, they are writing implements, and really they'd only be found uh, in rural environments, uh, possibly at villas, because uh, it's believed that literacy levels in, uh, in the rural environments were very low, um, but people in villas might have had the kind of wealth and education levels to, to use writing implements. Uh, they would be used alongside wax tablets, so wooden sort of pages that were infilled with wax and the sharp end would be used to carve uh, writing into the wax. And when you were done with those notes, you would use the wider end to erase them and scrape them out. Uh, they're in this display illustrating some of the tools that are used in surveying, as they would have been a very good way to jot down any measurements or any notes um, when you were plotting out uh, new building works or new uh, boundaries in the landscape. Someone has asked if we have a date for the legionary diploma. Yes, we do. Um, I'm going to, if you forgive me, I'm just going to read off our label because I can't, I'm not very good at remembering dates. AD 138 to 161. Um, you can sometimes, uh, on some more complete tablets, get really, really precise uh, dates, sometimes uh, down to the very day that they were issued. Um, but unfortunately, because this one is so fragmentary, um, we've just had to date it, I believe, from the, uh, from the careers of the political officials who are mentioned in the inscription. I think that's how we've got the date, or possibly from the dates that we know that the second cohort, Galorum, uh, were stationed in Britain. So there's clues that can allow us to date it, but unfortunately we haven't got the, the full picture with this one. And that's it, just some nice comments saying thank you. Oh, brilliant. Um, well, I hope you've enjoyed today's talk. Um, please do join us again in March and uh, have a lovely evening.